No one on YouTube has ever done this before. In this video, I'll be making literal plastic from cooking oil in my garage through an extremely long chemical process, and I've spent the past few weeks working on this, but first... Step 1. Grab the materials. All you'll need is a lower hemispherical heating mantle with SDC digital temperature controller or a hot plate with stirring, a borosilicate 2440 1 liter round bottom flask with ground glass joints with a 2440 30 cm reflex condenser, more borosilicate stoppers, a 250 milliliter separatory funnel, various Erlenmeyer flasks, beakers, stir bars, spatulas, stir rods, keck clips, stands, tubing, ice bath, pump, methyl alcohol, sodium hydroxide drain cleaner, optionally calcium chloride, filter paper, goggles, gloves, a lab coat, and finally your vegetable. Right, and don't forget to put a fume hood in your shopping cart. Step 2. Dry your glassware, uh, alright. Step 3. Get your vegetable oil. So here's my vegetable oil. You'll need about 500 mils per run, so I poured out a little. Looks pretty average, right? Well, you probably have a big can of waste cooking oil sitting at the back of your kitchen for decades, and you can use that as well. You can also get it for free from restaurants, if you didn't know that. Now, since my cooking oil is so fresh, I didn't have to do this, but if you do use waste cooking oil, make sure to use a 25 GPM oil centrifuge to separate. Just kidding. Just let it settle and then filter it through some fine coffee filters to get rid of any of the crumbs. It is also often recommended to dry the cooking oil with a drying agent, like calcium chloride to make sure that minimal water is present, as this might be important in the next step. You can then pour this through another filter. Now you have your vegetable oil cleaned. Finally, for the reaction, you can pour 500 mils of it into a big 1 liter round bottom flask. Let's move on to the next step. Step 4. Methyl oxide. Go get your sodium hydroxide methanol. Go! Quick, quick! Okay, it's not that intense. The reaction we're doing here, called a transesterification, needs a sodium hydroxide catalyst to form a methyl oxide ion in equilibrium. This will get our transformation going. So first pour in about 140 mils of methyl alcohol for every 500 mils of cooking oil. Be sure to not inhale the methanol vapors or drink it, because apparently 10 mils can make you blind. You can then pour in like 4 grams of sodium hydroxide, as you see here. Then chuck in a magnet thingy and get it mixing. It doesn't fully clear up, but when the big chunks disappear, you're good. So basically, this is the equation of what's happening right now. Essentially, it's a proton transfer. If you're new to chem, think of it as basic math. Methanol plus hydroxide equals methoxide plus water. Although, the equal sign isn't 100%, like, this transformation doesn't happen completely. Not all of the reactants are converted into products. Looking at the acidity of the two tells us that only around 6% of the hydroxide turns into methoxide. Step 5. Water bath. No, you don't go take a hot bath. Our 1 liter round bottom flask does. Specifically, we want the bath to constantly heat our reaction mixture at 60C without a heating mantle because I don't have one. You want to grab a bowl of water and fill it with an adequate amount of water. Then place our 1 liter round bottom flask in that bath. Step 6. Build the setup. This is called a Liebig a Lee big? Lee big condenser, bruh. Put it in. This is a glass stopper. Put it in. This is a funnel. Put it in. This is our 140 mils of sodium hydroxide and methanol mixture. Put it in. This is a thermometer with an adapter. Put it in. These are Keck clamps. Put it in. Just kidding. Put them on. Grammar, guys. Step 7. Get mixing. Now since methanol is polar and oil is nonpolar, aka they're immiscible, they're not going to mix ever and the reaction ain't gonna start happening. So you want to crank up the stirring to the max for maximum surface area between the two substances so that they can actually react at a feasible rate. You can see how it forms an interesting and opaque suspension. Step 8. Get heating. Now the reaction will be extremely slow without adequate heating as well. That's why you want to heat the water bath and closely monitor the temperature, making sure that it's actually at 60C and not higher or lower. And I'm seriously considering getting a temperature monitoring heating mantle, because I think I spent hours trying to make it stay at 60C and constantly monitoring this thing. Step 9. Wait for 3 hours. Nice, if you're new to this and wondering what this monstrosity of a setup is, it's called a reflux, bro where our reaction mixture is continually heated at a required temperature without losing any of our substances. This is because as they evaporate, they condense back down due to the cold water running in the condenser. This waiting part was the most annoying because I had to stay around it and babysit it for like 3 hours making sure its temp was at 60C, while being so sleep deprived. I began to understand why mad scientists are mad. Anyways, what we're doing here, although it looks like not much is happening, is a transesterification reaction. 
This is vegetable oil. It stores fat in the form of a triglyceride, which is a glycerol backbone bonded three times via an ester bond to three fatty acid chains. What we want to do is kick off that glycerol and replace it with three methyl groups that come from our methoxide ion, forming our biodiesel. Thus biodiesel is also known as fatty acid methyl esters. So this is what the full reaction equation looks like. The R represents the fatty acid chain. Simple, right? Ba okay, if you really want to know what happens, basically this methoxide ion is a really strong nucleophile, so it'll do a nucleophilic attack on this electrophilic central carbon in our triglyceride and try to attach on. Now since carbon can't have 5 bonds, these two electrons will be kicked onto the oxygen, giving it a formal negative charge, and then it will come back down again, but this time, it removes the glycerol. Now imagine this happening 3 times because it's a triglyceride, and all 3 bonds to the glycerol break, releasing the triol with 3 negative formal charges on the oxygens. Now since water was present in the methoxide equation, it'll come back and protonate it 3 times, forming neutral glycerol, and also reforming our hydroxide catalyst. I mean, isn't that just cool? Meanwhile, the nonchalant sodium ion is just watching all this chaos. He's like, nah, I'm just stay out of this. So you might think nothing happened in this one liter round bottom flask, but in reality, a snow globe of chemistry was going on inside. Step 10. Take it apart now, bruh. After like 2.5 to 3 hours, you can finally stop the reaction. When the stirring was stopped, this is what it looked like. Pretty neat, eh? I mean, immediately you can see it separating into two layers, and this is exactly what we wanted. The brown bottom layer is our dirty glycerol, which is denser than the oil, and the yellow layer on top is our biodiesel, aka fame. Step 11. Repeat this entire thing. You know me now. I like not only to make stuff, but I want to mass produce it. So I transferred the mixture into a big Erlenmeyer flask and did another entire run. Exactly the same because I wanted more of this bio juice. Step 12. Separate them. When both runs finished, I had sat in front of my fume hood for like 5 hours now staring into the beautiful yellow chemistry taking place. Then I can transfer everything from the two runs into my separatory funnel and pour it through multiple times to separate all the biodiesel from the glycerol. Anyways, as you can see here- oh shoot, a rookie mistake, but my separatory funnel was open low. Anyways, as I was saying, they slowly separate until shoot, my lab spontaneously caught on fire. Anyways, as I was saying, you need to give it a good amount of time for it to form two clear distinct layers, then drain it. By the way, my funnel is only 250 mils and my mixture is like 1.2 liters, so this took a few passes. Also, if you guys know anything about anything, you know that glycerol is clear and not this brown messy goop. And you're absolutely correct. This is because it's full of impurities. Now after separating the two, you can see the beaker full of dirty glycerol on my clean biodiesel. Now in my previous video, I did a full washing of the biodiesel and purified it, which took me an entire weekend, so if you want to see how I did that, check it out. But in this video, as I promised, I wanted to focus primarily on our glycerol that comes as a byproduct of this reaction. You see, previously I stated that this glycerol was our sideshow, but in this video, it's our main show. That's right, it's now the main character. Specifically, I wanted to dive deeper into humble glycerol layer, always sitting at the bottom because there is apparently a way to turn this dirty thing into plastic, and the specific type of plastic I'm talking about here is bioplastic. Step 13. Clean it. But before that, I gotta clean it first, and the first thing I did was place it on a hot plate and test the pH. Currently, it's pretty neutral, but that's about to change. Now because our glycerol here may have had some soap that formed when adding in the sodium hydroxide as you can see from the equation above, we need to get rid of it somehow. Soap is a basic salt, and it can react with hydrochloric acid, a strong acid to protonate the carboxylic group, turning it back into free fatty acids, which are nonpolar and will float to the top. By doing this, you can see a bunch of oil precipitate out, and this can be then separated by pouring it through a separatory funnel. After letting it set, I can drain our milky yellow layer, our glycerol, and then discard the rest. Then, 
before transferring it back onto our hot plate, I need to also make a sodium hydroxide solution, which will be needed for adjusting the pH back to neutral. Now by pouring it in bit by bit, you can see how I keep on overshooting it. And in a small amount of basic solution, it went directly from like a pH of 2 to 14. But that's okay, just add in some hydrochloric acid again to lower it. Finally, after a while of trial and error, I finally came to our desired pH of 7. And now I can crank up the heating as well as the stirring to get rid of all of the water that formed from my reaction, as well as the acid base neutralization. All the HCl reacting with the NaOH also formed table salt, which will settle to the bottom. Now you want to boil it down until it's basically dry glycerol and very viscous. And when I felt like it was done, I transferred our still hot glycerol into a storage bottle while leaving the salt behind as you can see in the beaker. I was confused on why there was so much smoke until I realized that glycerol is also used in vapes. I could then cap our nice little bottle of glycerol. But wait, you might be thinking, why is it still brown? Well, that's because the cleaning steps aren't finished yet, and there's still one more step we have to do. At first, I thought I had to do some vacuum distillation to get rid of those annoying colored impurities, but I quickly realized there's another way, which is to filter it through some activated charcoal. Step 14, Filtration. Now the best place I could find it was at a pet store, and it came in these granules. So the first step would be to crush these up into a fine powder to increase the surface area where it can absorb the impurities. After pouring it in a bit and grinding it, I realized it took way too long, so it was then transferred into a Ziploc bag and crushed and hammered and stepped on, and then I realized I was actually struggling to pulverize myself. But when it was fine enough, I called it a day and moved on to the next step, which was to bring my brown juice to my school and do the next few steps of cleaning. When I got there, the first thing I did was put it on a hot plate to heat up the glycerol a bit so it could be way less viscous and more watery. That way I can actually pour it out. When that was done, it was then transferred into a round bottom flask. Wait, shoot I don't even know why I did that. Anyways, when that was done, it was then transferred into a beaker and diluted with a good amount of methanol. This is so that the filtration process can occur easier, otherwise if it's too viscous it would be way too messy. Now with that bag of powdered charcoal I had, it was then brought to school and I measured out about 15 grams for the filtration. With my beaker of diluted glycerol on the hot plate with medium heat and stirring, the charcoal was then added in and left to stir for a while. Some calcium chloride was added as well. When I came back to vacuum filter after a few hours, well, I thought everything was going to work out well until it didn't. Gosh, don't you just hate yellow chemistry? Essentially, activated charcoal didn't work, and the yellow impurities were still there. I really couldn't figure out why this was the case, especially because it worked for many other people, like even now red. I also left it there for hours, so I was confident it would have worked. Well, this isn't the first time experiments fail. In the end, I believe it all came down to one issue. Not enough surface area. You see, this is what activated carbon looks like. It's so porous, my grind-up version can't even compare to it, I guess. So yep, I went to go buy a bottle of myself, activated version, and I poured it back into the beaker. This time, it practically became a tar-like thick black stirry, and I think that's a good sign. It means the particles are actually really fine. This was left to stir for another few hours to really give it enough time, and then transfer to the vacuum filter to filter off the carbon. As you can see, yes, it's actually working this time. I guess surface area really matters. Lastly, since I diluted all of this glycerol with methanol to make it more watery, I then needed to either let it evaporate or distill it off, which is what I did here. When this was done, I was left with my final, nice and clean glycerol. Finally, I can get to making the plastic with this. Step 15. Make the plastic. Now in order to synthesize this bioplastic, all you'll need is some water, vinegar, cornstarch, and our glycerol. I decided to use all of my glycerol, so this is going to be done on a pretty massive scale, but you don't need that much if you're going to try this at home. After dumping in the glycerol, we can then add in a good amount of cornstarch. I believe I used around 50 grams or 45 grams, and it was unnecessarily messy lol. It was then diluted with a good amount of water, along with a small amount of vinegar. We can then place this on the hot plate and crank the heat up to medium or high. You see, plastic is, according to the dictionary, a synthetic material made from a wide range of organic polymers. 
This means that it can be a polymer of ethylene, lactic acid, or even amino acids, I think. Does that mean that our proteins are technically plastics too? I guess microplastics aren't that bad after all. In our plastic making step, we're not actually polymerizing and making a new polymer. We're directly processing the polymer that's involved in the starch, called polysaccharides. So this is what starch looks like. What you're seeing right now is in fact something called amylopectin, a major component of it. Pretty weird, right? However, if we zoom in a bit, it makes a lot more sense. Those little hexagons that form branches are in fact just a bunch of sugars bonded together by alpha-1,4 glycosidic bonds. As the mixture is heated, the starch granules absorb water and swell. The heat then breaks the hydrogen bonds that hold each granule's crystalline structure together, so the granules kind of melt into the water and releases the amylopectin. This is called gelatinization. The vinegar then catalyzes the hydrolysis of the branched amylopectin, breaking the bonds and turning them into straight-changed amylose, like breaking the branches off of a tree. These straighter chains can align with each other more effectively, so the final plastic film can form a stronger, more ordered network. Our glycerol acts as the plasticizer, and what it does is it inserts itself into the chains, disrupting starch-starch interactions and forming new hydrogen bonds of their own. This helps make the plastic more flexible rather than brittle, and the more you add, the more stretchy it will be. Now at first, it stayed very liquid and nothing much really happened. I waited, and waited, and waited, but even after waiting like multiple minutes, it didn't get any bit more viscous. I thought I made a mistake until the entire stir bar suddenly got stuck and the bottom started hardening. I realized this was because the bottom of the beaker got the most heat, and so the reaction took place the fastest. I then immediately took it off the hot plate, and while it was still nice and hot, I poured it onto a flat plate like this. It's pretty slimy and kind of likes to hold its shape, so it's a good idea to spread it out with something. I think I should have also poured less onto this plate so that I could be thinner. Anyways, I left this thick layer of plastic goop dry for about a week, but the thinner the layer is, the quicker it will dry. Here, the amylose linear chains hydrogen bond to each other and reform into a semi-crystalline matrix. When I came back, it looked like this. There we go, voila, this is our bioplastic. I mean, even though it broke apart, I kinda expected that as this usually happens during the drying process. The big pieces were still opaque and white, which means they hadn't completely dried yet. It's kind of rubbery when it still contains moisture as well. However, some of the pieces on the edges that were thinner dried much well and it really feels like plastic. I'm sure if I gave the thicker ones more time, it would have also turned into a texture like this. It was also much more transparent, and I think overall this transformation was pretty successful. In the end, I think I spent around 30 to 40 hours. It really took a lot of time to put all of this together. I was also curious about how it burned, and so I got a piece that still contained some moisture and one that was completely dried. After bringing it outside and blasting it with a blowtorch, the wet ones seemed to just shrivel up a bit, and the dry ones started charring. None of them actually burned though, but I didn't expect them to erupt into fireballs anyways. Step 16. Subscribe. Step 17. Support Carbon on Patreon. Thank you so much dedicated viewer for making it to the end for real. Again, I really want to thank my Patreon supporters for making these projects affordable, and I will provide behind the scenes, early access, shoutouts, and more. If you would like to support a high school student like me, just $3 will go a long way in helping this channel to continue providing quality and educational chem content. Anyways, thank you so much for watching till the end, and please consider clicking the subscribe button below.